Hi, everyone, and good evening. Welcome again to tonight's online community forum, Straight Talk. My name is Pam Duncan. I'm the president and CEO of Metropolitan Development Council. We have been partnering for this series of conversations with the Tacoma Urban League and my cohort, who I now can um, introduce as Washington State Senator Twana Nobles, has been um, an excellent partner for these conversations. She is running a little bit late this evening. Uh, we will begin our conversation with Senator Nobles as soon as she comes on board, but I just wanted to make you aware as our audience how much we greatly appreciate you joining in. Tonight is the 31st in a series of conversations. You might recall that we started these conversations focused on the coronavirus and to be able to share with the community what is going on as we talk about the uh, coronavirus. Over the course of the time that we've been holding these conversations, there are so many other things that have come up that we decided we needed to continue having these conversations and not focus solely on the coronavirus and its impacts. Although we all know that the coronavirus has impacted pretty much every part of our daily life. We are now fortunate to have Senator, State Senator Twana Nobles join us. Um, Madam Senator, I was just introducing, opening up our session and we are just going to the part where we would like to publicly acknowledge this meeting is being conducted on the indigenous lands of the Puyallup people. We gratefully acknowledge that we rest on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people where they make their home and speak the Lushoot Seed language. Thank you. Throughout today's conversation, you can submit your questions that we will address using the Q&A function in Zoom. We cannot promise that we will get to every question. We will do our absolute best. And I'm sure like me, many of you have a lot of questions for Senator Nobles. So um, we will begin now and Senator Nobles, thank you and welcome. And we celebrate that this was your first day in your official role as Washington State Senator. Wow, wow. So I know we are all excited about that. Um, I, I have so many ways that we have interacted that um, right now I'm, a, I'm getting a little emotional just seeing um, you and addressing you as State Senator Nobles, but congratulations. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm still Tawana. <laughs> um, but I do have a big new job and today was the first day and it was amazing to take my um, first votes of several. I, I do wanna take a moment to thank everyone who um, was supportive of me, who believed in our campaign, who made calls, who made donations, who just put in tremendous work. And I hope folks feel, especially in this season, that grassroots and community-based work can create change and that we can, as a community, elect the people that we want to see um, represent us. So I feel very honored and um, overjoyed today. And I'm excited to share some of what I've been working on is the first day of work and unlike maybe other jobs in the state Senate, you hit the ground running. <laughs> um, there, I've already been through orientation, but it's, it's on the job training. Um, so I'll pause in case there's more you want to say, Pam, but I'd love to, to share with everyone um, kind of what I'm 
thinking of, of working on this session. Okay, well, we've got a lot. Um, <clears throat> with your new role, we know that you announced some changes last week and we thought we would um, really like for you to share what else has been going on and what are the changes that you've announced um, to our Straight Talk audience. Thank you. Well, a couple of things. I did announce last week that I would be transitioning from Tacoma Urban League. Um, it will be a little while before that happens, but it was important when we dropped the job announcement that people weren't confused as to, wait, what? I thought Tawana was the CEO. Um, so it was important that I, I also announced um, moving on from the position. I plan to stay on as CEO until we hire a new CEO. And I hope that that is... Um, accomplished by mid-March. Um, mm -hmm. Hiring in COVID is very challenging, and especially for an organization like Tacoma Urban League that um, needs a very strong leader who not only is um, familiar with business practices, but also has a heart for community. So we definitely want to take our time and make a really good um, choice. I also will stay on, once we have a new CEO, I'll stay on and train that new CEO. So that will be some time, um, some additional time that I, I will stay connected to the organization, helping to train the new CEO. So I'm not going anywhere um, permanently for some time and I'll always be a supporter and hopefully folks um, were able to read my blog post and just see some of the successes of Tacoma Urban League and all the ways that I feel tremendously proud of our work and feel comfortable moving on. I, I believe I have achieved what God placed me here to achieve at Tacoma Urban League. And now that I have been elected to the state Senate, um, I'm excited to do that next step. And, it, it, and, and to be honest, it's more of a, a national urban league policy where national does not want its CEOs balancing a job like state senator and also um, mm -hmm. CEO of an affiliate. That, that work needs to be cared for. And mm -hmm. my job definitely, my new job takes me away, but I still will have a full-time job. I mean, I'm available for employment. I'm just kidding. I do have a plan already. <laughs> um, I have another really cool um, job offer but in other news, folks should know too, this is something else that I didn't necessarily announce, but it's exciting and I'm participating in it. Folks should definitely watch the Discovery Channel's Undercover Billionaire because it's happening in Tacoma um, and it aired last Wednesday. And so the second episode will air this Wednesday, um, but it also kind of shares a little bit a little bit more details about my journey this, this past year. Um, but I have plans, very exciting plans, um, but I, it's important that I have a full-time job because I have a family. So I'm not a full-time legislator, although I'm excited for this work. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say a little bit more about the uh, undercover billionaire piece? First of all, you all should be so proud of this city. So undercover billionaire is, um, now that I've been able to go back and do some research, what happens in the show Undercover Billionaire, it's, it airs on Discovery Channel, but you can probably stream it on um, you know, streaming channels, uh, season one at least. Season two is out now. Entrepreneurs who are millionaires and billionaires are secretly dropped in a city. They are stripped of all of their networks and resources, given $100, an old vehicle, and told you have 90 days to create a business in a city you've never visited before, you've never built in. Um, a never, um, I don't know what I was trying to say, but a, never, a city you've never been to before um, or lived in. And the premise is if you're an entrepreneur, you, you, you're a creative person, you're an innovative person, the, the core values and the skill set that you have should be able to be applied anywhere else. So if that is true, then demonstrate um, that ability and take $100 and flip it into a million dollar business again in a brand new city. Mm -hmm. And you can't use any of your business contacts. And on season two, three cities were selected and Tacoma was one of those cities. So there is 
Um, there was a millionaire who was dropped off in Tacoma and had to, from scratch, try to build a million dollar business and could only get to know folks in Tacoma. And just what I love already from what I've seen on the episodes is the Tacoma community was so kind and so mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that folks will know if they watch season one is all the individuals who did not know that um, the, the, this business owner right. actually had resources, but helped them anyway, gets to benefit. Like in season one, the individuals got a, you know points in the business or they were part ownership or were offered long-term positions in the business. And so I think what I learned from season one, um, which is out on like Discovery Plus right now. What I learned from season one is just the importance of always being kind. And of course my job at Tacoma Urban League because I did have some interactions, I got to meet, I got this random message. Thank the Lord, I check my messages even on social media, but I got a random message from a woman who said, I'm new to Tacoma, starting a business. I know you're the CEO of Tacoma Urban League and I just you know, would love to meet with you and see if there are any ways for you to, to help me. And I said, of course, but please email me here at work um, because that's where I like to, you know, do all my Urban League work. And so we were able to connect and I did my best to help her with some, some resources here in Tacoma, but so did so many other folks here in Tacoma, just mm -hmm. demonstrate kindness, demonstrate compassionate Tacoma. Mm -hmm. um, and so folks have to watch the show to see what happened, but I'm just really proud of this city for standing up and, um, being the true Tacomans that, you know, we are. I live in Fircrest, so I definitely rep Fircrest, but, you know, Tacoma Pierce County area. But yeah. please watch the show or go back and watch yeah. season two because okay. Tacoma is on the map and it's not for cops. <laughs> okay. okay. So what I hear um, is um, a reiteration of something that um, we are exhorted to do to be hospitable because in doing so, we have often entertained angels unawares. So, um, yeah. Be kind, be compassionate. Yeah. Thank you for uh, that. So um, I will check that out. Yeah. And I'm glad every you brought Wednesday. that up. Um, <laughs> what's that? So it comes on every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Thank you. And so you actually also answered my question about what happens next with the leadership of the Tacoma Urban League and a, um, a question that begs to be answered, asked and answered on the heels of that is, so what does that mean for straight talk? So um, this is something that Twina and I have had a conversation about um, and with mixed emotions um, that um, of we, we are seeing where things um, began to change a little. I'm also um, really excited about it. So uh, we, we had this conversation mm, and um, after the e election about what this would mean. And for the audience, I like to say that this has been uh, for not only MDC, but for me, very meaningful because um, this is a, um, a sister to me who is um, a sister in many ways. And I wanted to have the opportunity to show community what it looks like when black women work together and that we could partner and we could do something really powerful. And the idea was initially that we would have these conversations about coronavirus. Coronavirus, COVID is the thing that made the conversations happen about, hey, let's let's talk about doing this and not have it turf-based, but uh, community focus. And as we um, continue down this journey of straight talk, we just saw that there were opportunities. There are opportunities to talk about so many things that people on the ground who may not be in the thousands of Zoom conversations like we are every day have an opportunity to hear about. So uh, that was how we started. Twana, what would you like to weigh in about? 
I definitely thank you for having this, um, for having a vision for us to be able to enter into this um, experience together because I think you might have had already completed one episode and maybe I came in on a second episode or maybe I did start from the beginning, but mm -hmm. I started from the beginning, but mm -hmm. this was definitely your vision for how our organizations um, could be leading conversations around coronavirus. And I think not enough in, in this way because it, it didn't become it didn't become an ownership thing. Who who owns this and who who runs this? I think we do a, a lot in partnership in the community, but this was very organic and very um, loving. And, and the care and concern was for community and making sure we got the best information, the most accurate um, information out to the community that we shared resources and connections for families, for businesses. And so it has been a complete um, joy to work with you. I just appreciate your vision and for your ability to be inclusive um, as a leadership style um, because MDC and Tacoma Urban League are have drastically different sizes. We have five to six employees on any given day and I don't know how many hundreds maybe employees in DC might have or dozens. Um, so to include us as a little baby organization and such um, impactful work and include us in such an important conversation for our community. I'm very grateful and, and thankful for that. And I know our community has um, been able to receive really important information and resources and been introduced to other community members on this show. So I definitely wish Straight Talk the best. The challenge for me is I now have transportation. I mean, we haven't gotten into what I'm going to be working on, but I have a committee meeting now on Mondays from four to six. Mm -hmm. So I simply will not be mm -hmm. available. Um, but straight talk is still as as valuable and important and, you know, has an excellent leader, multiple leaders um, who are able to continue to offer the conversation. I'm sad that I, I can no longer, you know, make this 5 p.m. showtime, but encourage that our community will continue to get real accurate and really important information. Thank you. And so this has been as much about relationship as partnership. The organization's partner, but it's the relationship. And so this has been edifying for me as well. It has been, um, it opened up opportunities for discussion that we could not have even envisioned. Um, not necessarily that we want it to happen, but by virtue of things that are going on in community, we were able to sit here with other colleagues and openly um, express our pain, share that pain, and to talk about the impacts of things that go on in the community in a way that uh, may not happen in other settings. So it has been it has been very meaningful. Um, and I, from what I have heard back from folks who have tuned in, like, wow, this has been very, very powerful. And it's my sincere hope that we continue with that, um, knowing that we won't be seeing state Senator Twana Nobles on the screen. Um, you know, you are always welcome to come back. And not only are you welcome to come back, but I will ping you to come back. But um, so the faces may change a little, but we will continue the important work of holding straight talk and being straight about our talk. That's right. Um, so we do want to ask you a few questions about your first day. Um, what took place? You talked about the orientation. I can't even imagine what that was like, but tell us about your first day. Yeah, and orientation happened weeks ago and it was all on Zoom. Um, so a, a lot of, I just want to share this, folks who were like, make sure you are kind of rubbing elbows and getting to know the rest of your cohort in orientation. I'm like, we're on Zoom and it's just presentation after presentation. It's not in-person <laughs> orientation like the rest of you all. Um, and our videos, you know, our camera and microphones are off and we're just absorbing information. So it's very different. What I loved about today being my first day, you know, not just having the, the honor and privilege of being in the, the Senate chamber, 
I'm surrounded by marble walls. I think what I loved so much is I met a lot of my colleagues for the first time today, but it seemed like we have been best friends. I mean, I have been talking to many of these individuals for months, um, even on a campaign trail, they just were excited about me running and they were really supportive. But there were folks who I didn't even realize today was the first time I had met them in person. Our relationship had wow. um, deepened so much. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that because if there's one thing that I learned you know, running a full, a fully remote campaign is you can build team and build relationship um, and have common goals and accomplish really good work. Um, even if you haven't met in real life, that's possible. So I'm in encouraged today was the only day in session that we would be in person together. The rest of the days um, will be, uh, we're encouraged to work remotely. Senators are allowed to work in their offices, so it's not off the table for senators, um, but we are encouraged to work remotely. Um, I, my office is not put together, just so folks know, my office will be in Sherburg, it's 226, but my office is, you know, left the way it, it was after they painted and cleaned it up. So today I was in Senator Emily Randall's office and because she's a part of leadership, she was on the floor. And we all had to stay in a designated space and we voted in groups so that we could remain socially distant. Um, and so I was in group three and I stayed in Senator Randall's office unless I needed to go down, um, and she's on the fourth floor, unless I needed to go down to the third floor to vote. Um, and you all should know your girl wore heels on her first day, which is a little <laughs> bit of a challenge on the stairs, but thankfully there are lots of elevators too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like I should have wore like my Apple watch or a Fitbit because of the up and down and up and down for the votes. But it just is really, I think, surreal. I, um, I worked with um, Mayor Woodard, who, I, you know, Mama Mayor, I just call it Victoria, to pick out the suit I wanted to wear today for this historic moment. My only day, likely this session that I would um, be in person um, in the Senate chambers to vote and to do the work of, of the people. But it was important for me to, um, to represent my district, to keep them in my heart and in my mind, um, to look good and feel good. Um, I think we anticipated maybe staying there late at night, a combination of you never know how long floor action will take. And also we didn't know what to expect with, with protests, um, but I felt safe. I was nervous leading up to today, there were multiple security conversations and based on what happened in DC, um, I wasn't sure what might happen our first day of session, but I, I just wanna um, thank the state troopers and National Guard members, and I mean hundreds um, surrounding a perimeter. We, we were, there was a gate where only legislators or staff could enter, but they totally made our arrival smooth, we were safe. All of our, many of us had a lot of anxiety around what might happen um, and everything was mm -hmm. completely fine. All the checkpoints, I mean, staff worked tremendously hard to have this day run smoothly. And I, and I think I checked in with you before three o'clock and we, or around three o'clock and we were, we were done with our, our floor action for today. So it was, I didn't really know what to expect. For everyone else, this is different. For me, this is all I know. This is how right. I know session. Right. And everybody keeps right. telling me it's so different. It's so different. Um, but today was fantastic. And, you know, I'll do the, the remaining remainder of session from home. Mm -hmm. But I feel blessed and honored. And um, I, I won't go further. I'm sure you have other questions, but I'm excited to tell you other things that I, I worked on today on my first day of work. But, um, but it was great. It was pretty flawless as far as what I could see. Mm -hmm. So, yep, I do have a lot of other questions and we will get to conversations about what we saw at um, the National Capitol and subsequently um, more locally. I do want to ask first, um, which committees will you have a role in? Yeah, I am vice chair on two committees and serve on four committees. So I'm vice chair for early learning in K-12. I am also vice chair for higher education and workforce development. I will serve on the transportation committee and behavioral health subcommittee.
okay. Do, do you get to select those? Good question. Um, I get to make suggestions for the committees I would like to serve on. But the committee on committees um, committee ultimately has committee. to juggle, right? <laughs> has to juggle and shift and figure out numbers and where people need to serve. And some things are based on seniority. Some committees like Ways and Means have a waiting list. Um, I actually played a little prank. We, we had to turn in a form to suggest or recommend committees to be on. So I played a little prank as a freshman. Um, one, to show, you know, my sense of humor, but two, because I was also serious. So you're supposed to select, you know, three committees to serve on. And I sent my form back with only one committee and it was ways and means. Um, and they, they tell you, don't ask for ways and means. You're not going to get on ways and means as a freshman. There's a waiting list. And I'm like, well, I'm just letting you know, I'm highly interested. This is, this is the one committee I want to be on. So I emailed that form first, just like as a joke. Cause I, I knew that would be like, this girl does not understand instructions. And who was going to tell this freshman that this is not the way this goes. Mm -hmm. um, but then I followed up with my real form and I still listed ways and means as like, a fourth one, because I really would love to serve on that committee. Um, but I did land on other committees that I was interested in. So it's a, it's also, it's a balance of, you know, they look at what's good for your district, what's good for your, your skill set and experience. It's important to make recommendations for where you want to land, because I do want to be on a committee that's going to um, affect issues that are important in our district. I also want to be on committees that are a stretch for me where I can learn. I, another committee I was interested in being on was like, um, I think it's energy, technology, and mm -hmm. environment. I would have loved to have been on that committee, but mm -hmm. you know, most people are on two to three committees. Mm -hmm. My early learning committee is a smaller committee and my behavioral health committee is a smaller committee. So they're not two full committees like mm -hmm. transportation mm -hmm. and um, sorry, higher ed and behavioral health are smaller versus early learning and transportation. So it sounds like a lot, but I'm, I'm hoping it will be, you know, easy to manage and, and balance. So mm -hmm. I get a little say, but the committee on committees makes the determination. Hey, that's, that sounds so much like government that there is a committee on committees, but this whole thing is so exciting. I, um, this is, I just can't wait to see what starts coming out, bubbling up, um, from your involvement. So, um, I do. Let's let's go ahead and pivot and talk about what happened last week. So after what we saw on TV and the storming of the governor's residence, um, you mentioned how safe you felt, and that's so um, reassuring. But what are your thoughts about what we saw as a nation and what we saw locally? Yeah, I think my thoughts are shared by many other individuals. What I saw was a different reaction and a different consequence and, and different accountability for individuals um, that I do believe are working really hard to uphold white, white supremacy and a very different treatment for community members that, are, that have legit fought for oppressed and marginalized community members. I believe in protests and demonstrations and disruption. You know, I think that's, that's a part of the process. That's a part of how we get what we need in our communities. I, I witnessed, um, you know, I, I witnessed criminal activity and the lack of accountability and very different treatment um, for that criminal behavior. And so I think it, it left me, I mean, I had to practice really good self-care and just like what I, I saw on social media um, because it wasn't, it wasn't new information. I wasn't surprised. Surprise, right. I, you know, I, I definitely wasn't like, I can't believe this. No, I, I believe it. This, this, this is America. This is the America that we, that we live in. Mm -hmm. And I just felt continued disappointment and, and disgust for um, the ways that some community members can show up and not be held accountable. And so I am looking forward to accountability and a continued communication that we will not tolerate, you know, white supremacy in this country, that we will not tolerate that type of behavior in this country. 
Um, but it, it, it was, it was a lot. And, and I felt like it, there wasn't anything more I could say or add that folks weren't, weren't already saying. And there were, there were no surprises. I'm grateful. You know, I checked in on um, Congresswoman Strickland to make sure she was okay. I think more than anything, I wanted to make sure that the officers on site who were doing their job and, and protecting staff there and members there were okay, that, you know, members and staff were, were safe. You know, my heart broke for them. Um, but I just, I, I wasn't surprised by the behavior of the Trump supporters. And I'm not surprised by the lengths at which they will go to, to uphold white supremacy. Um, and that just made me really reflect on our safety as members here in our state and what could happen. Today, I felt absolutely safe when I was there and all the safety protocols were in place. But again, it took numerous conversations and we had conversations as members, you know, as our caucus, but we also had conversations, you know, as a black caucus and as member of, as the member of color caucus, because again, as a black woman, I feel my safety, um, how I, I feel for my safety, I believe is different than maybe some of my colleagues. It's, it, for me, it wasn't a like, let's see what happens. Let's, I wanted information and details about how our state was going to be committed to keeping me safe. Mm -hmm. um, that type of behavior does not make me feel safe. The, the idea of the threat of that type of behavior does not make me feel safe. Yeah. So I needed a commitment, a promise, a plan for our safety. And definitely um, the governor and all of the law enforcement who were present um, made our safety a priority. And so we were able to conduct business today um, safely. Yeah, there's there's so many things that you said that I um, am completely um, right in line with you about, um, and and of course I get it. I, what have you seen? What would you share that you've heard about the impact, like the emotional impact, the um, and just the societal impact of what happened because as you said it's not a surprise if someone's surprised then they've been living under a rock but what is what's the ensuing impact here's the best way i could summarize it and i agree like i as a community member and, and we as a community are not asking police to brutalize those individuals as they have brutalized black and brown bodies. But what we recognized is they know how to deescalate. They know how to handle challenging um, situations. They know how to handle behavior that they have deemed and that others can clearly see is criminal without taking the life of an individual. And I think what I too wanna see is that same treatment as a black person in this country. Mm -hmm. I think that's like, that hopefully more people could see mm -hmm. when black folks spent and, and you know when allies but we'll focus on you know when when black folks spent time this summer chanting and demanding that people see and say that black lives matter mm -hmm. it just was a completely different treatment mm -hmm. but it was evident last week that our law enforcement officers know how to handle those situations without brutalizing and murdering citizens. Mm -hmm. I want them to show up in that way for us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because the interesting, one of the many interesting things, the disparity, one of the disparities is that there was a, um, a group that peacefully wanted to elevate the value of a human life and being focused on the value of black lives, right? We're talking about humanity and the response to the elevation about recognize our value. And then a 
the very different response to a com to dissatisfaction about the electoral the election outcome to not getting their way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so, it's not fair and it's not right and it was um what i was having a conversation with some folks about um for and 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 this was i think probably across the board like folks watching this um black and brown community saying wow this <laughs> like right there in the moment this is very different <laughs> and i think it just highlights one, what many of us have been saying in a community, what organizations like Tacoma Urban League have been saying about the injustice that exists, about the, the different levels of accountability and treatment um, experienced by, you know, Black and white community members, by community members of, of you know, different um, skin color in general in this country, and it's not right. It also highlights, again, no, no surprise, just the work that continues um, to need to happen, you know, it, 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 it validated and, and affirms the work that organizations like Tacoma Urban League and MDC and the NAACP and the Tacoma Pierce County Black Collective, um, the necessity of that work and, and why we do that work. It just validated and reaffirmed, you know, the importance of, of, of our work and, and why we must continue to let our community know that Black lives matter and, the systems are not fair and they are not just. And what we witnessed on Wednesday was not right. And I definitely want to see accountability. Proportionately, not 40 people were like proportionate accountability for what we witnessed on Wednesday. Would you say some more about that? What does proportionate accountability mean to you? Yeah, well, for you to have hundreds of individuals who committed crimes, and so few of them are being held accountable legally, are, are being arrested. Um, to me, that's disappointing and unacceptable. When we, when we saw hundreds of you know, community members be arrested and charged, again, for peacefully protesting mm -hmm. this past summer, mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that for the number of people who committed crimes, they are charged for those crimes, that the work is done to find those individuals and to hold them accountable for the crimes that they committed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For and the terrorism, right? For the acts of terrorism. Or, or I want to see them, terrorism. I want to see them held accountable for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I'm waiting for. And it begins with um, the leadership that encouraged that. That's my, I got to bring yes. at that end. Um, when we see that the sitting president encouraged and was offsite watching this in anticipation of what they might do. So, um, Let's talk about the inauguration is coming up on January 20th. What are your thoughts and concerns for that event? I want our vice president elect and president elect to be safe. You know, I look forward to learning more about the details of that event. It's an important event. It's a, it's a change of leadership that I, I couldn't be more excited to witness. I can't help but to wonder what will happen on that day, to fear what will happen on that day. Mm -hmm. But I pray all of the necessary safety measures are in place. Um, that one, because we're in a pandemic, but two, mm -hmm. even just based upon what happened on Wednesday, um, that this inauguration looks different and that's okay. That's okay. I want to make sure that our our president elect and vice president elect um, are able to to transition mm -hmm. and take the reins and, and lead us into the future 
that we all were, were counting on and praying for and, and betting on when we cast our, our votes. Um, so I, I don't know what to expect, but based on what happened Wednesday, anything can happen. Mm-hmm. Anything can happen. So knowing that, I just, I hope all the, all the key decision makers are, are wise and, and know that it's okay for this to look and feel different so we can keep everyone mm-hmm. safe. It's okay. Yep. 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 Because of yep. the pandemic, because of potential violence, um, because of potential resistance, um, it's okay. Yeah, we, we want to see them. We want to see them take over the White House. That's it. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is a um, sea change. Um, and what we've been accustomed to is you think about historically how things have um, taken place. You know, the inauguration has always been like something that's um, widely attended. Um, just even how people would, you know, the, the new president would um, just travel through the streets. Um, you know, that began to change um, some time ago. I probably, especially after the um, assassination of Kennedy. Um, but now we, this is also a big, a major change that will likely set the course for moving forward, whatever it is that we see next week. Um, And like you said, you know what? It's okay. Whatever that is that ensures the transition of power, the safety of those who are being sworn in, and just however we make certain that um, our leaders are being um, look, looked after. I like what it you said, make it's moment. okay. It doesn't make the moment any less significant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like, hey, we've had to transition from in-person meetings to, you know, almost, you know, 99% anyway, uh, being having conversations and meetings online, and it doesn't change the significance of the conversation. So um, I, I really like what you said. So I'm wondering, and I, I'm going to pivot back to your role. Um, I'm wondering, what are you, Senator Nobles, excited about in serving now in this new capacity? What are you like, oh, I can't wait to do this. Um, What is it? Well, I mean, lots of things. Some things I can't wait to do this and we realistically may be able to this session and other things will just take some time and I may just be excited to work on it and to do my part. Um, So I'll start with one that's large and I I have, it's, it's far larger than just me, but it's important for our district and, and for Pierce County. Um, and that's car tab relief. I recognize that for a lot of our community members, um, it's a challenge to afford the car tab price. Um, mm-hmm. And in the way, and what I learned, because a lot of people say $30, $30 card tabs. And what I learned is like the base tab is actually $30, but the taxes that have been added to it mm-hmm. have increased the total amount that we pay to renew our tabs. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to, I'm interested and excited about finding ways to relieve that financial burden on our community members, you know, especially now in this pandemic, it's just not as, that one is just not easy. It, it involves a lot of individuals even in my idea to like an idea that we talked about to reduce costs, it may, it may add an additional fee for, you know, convenience. And so I'm like, well, if I'm, I'm trying to get people to pay less, not more. So it's a lot to figure out and and talk through. And and that one just does not have a very easy fix. And I have to learn a lot of historical information um, as well. Mm-hmm. But it's been really a really great journey already, um, meeting with staff and learning about the issue. But that's something that I'm excited to work on and excited to, to pass as legislation, some type of car tab relief. Um, something that I'm hoping I can actually pass this 
session that may be a little bit easier because of the support is um, a bit of a, a change to the college bound scholarship. I don't know if how many folks are familiar with the college bound scholarship, but in years past students in seventh or eighth, seventh and eighth grade can sign up for the college bound scholarship. And as long as they have had a 2.0, no felony, graduated from Washington State High School and plan to attend a you know, state school two or four years, they have funds to pay for their college education. Mm-hmm. Well, my daughter was an eighth grader this past spring and COVID happened and it was on our to-do list to apply for the college bound scholarship but schools were closed. That obviously was not a priority. And what I learned is all of those students were automatically enrolled. So now they're ninth graders and they have been automatically, eighth graders who did not get to sign up are automatically enrolled in the College Bound Scholarship Program, which is a a, a lifesaver. But I'm trying to work on, the, the that's a good thing, automatically enrolling. What I learned though is And just in case people don't know and they're thinking, well, what's different? What changed? Typically to sign up for the college bound scholarship, there is a form that comes home and you sign this contract as a parent or guardian or adult and the student also signs it. Mm -hmm. And that has been the binding legal document that really ensures that that ties the state to paying for your college education. What happens with the automatic enrollment if we don't pass the correct legislation? So that that happened because of COVID and that was something the governor um, mandated happen for those students so they wouldn't miss out. But it's a, it's a really good idea and we can make it more permanent with legislation. And so I'm trying to work on this, the Senate bill um, that would retain the auto enrollment. But what I'm learning is there may be some challenges if we don't have that legal binding contract. Like auto enrollment is good, but it doesn't necess- it doesn't equate to future leaders in our state legislature, including that in in the budget. And there isn't a binding document with just the auto enrollment. And so we're trying to figure out how to still make it an entitlement, a guarantee, because that contract, and some argue, well, not really. You mean to tell me a contract signed by a teenager is, you know, legal binding or a preteen. But we're just trying to make sure that with auto enrollment, we don't lose the promise that we don't lose the actual dedicated funds for those students. Um, But I think to change that program to now students are automatically enrolled. Um, And I actually had a really great conversation today to remove some of the other qualifications to be more inclusive so more students could qualify. And that would be really exciting. But that's something I hope because the auto enrollment is already in place due to COVID, I'm hoping we can make it more permanent. But I wanna make sure that we don't miss loopholes and when students are completing their, their FAFSA for college, they're told, oh, the state budget change, we don't have the money this year because we didn't pay close attention to the language that makes those funds an entitlement for students. Mm-hmm. So I'm learning a lot and I really have wanted that to be the first bill that I drop. Um, it requires some more work. So I probably will be dropping some other bills before, but also, you know, um, many of you might've read the story about um, a d- domestic violence situation involving a, a soldier on joint base, Lewis McCord and, um, and his partner. And, and that's, there are lots of stories like that, but I know in our um, community, there um, are so many um, domestic violence situations that also um, need us to pay attention to and think about how legislation can help the victims of domestic violence, you know, to look at what's missing, what type of support is missing, um, how we can be proactive. Um, So I'm also looking at um, considering just alone the headlines we've seen around some of the situations pertaining to constituents of mine who, you know, that family lived in DuPont. So it's not just the, the military base, but when I think about constituents in my district, um, military affiliated or not, in, in just dealing with the pandemic, dealing with all these tough situations, I want to make sure I'm doing my best to help the victims of domestic violence. And, and we're seeing an increase um, in those, those cases. So there's, you know, no excuse. There are lots of organizations who are also trying to figure out and problem solve and and help those families. I wanna make sure I'm doing 
the best that I can to support and help those victims. Um, so I'll be working on some um, DV legislation. I also am excited to, I, today I was actually really excited. I'm telling you, I felt like a real legislator as I'm on my phone, <laughs> you know, calling up um, community and technical college presidents to ask them how they felt about a piece of legislation that was um, sent my way because I wanna make sure that, you know, the stakeholders who are named in the legislation are supportive of it as well. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to be able to support legislation that would, um, you know, increase offerings at community and technical colleges. But what I've definitely learned is you want to make sure you look at who's for it, who's against it, how does it impact the community. Um, and so that sounds great to increase opportunity, but is this what community and technical colleges want? You know, how do four year colleges feel about this? So it's not as cut and dry as I think I thought in the beginning where I'm like, this is awesome. Who would want this? And it's like, well, ask the people if they really want this. Um, so those things are exciting to me. I also, um, I'm hoping to get some bipartisan support for a data collection bill that would, you know, help us with police transparency and accountability. Um, that would be exciting to have my first, you know, bipartisan bill, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of work. I mean, that's, it's not just writing legislation. And for me, it's not just writing legislation and dropping a bill. I want to make sure that I'm actually meeting a real need in the community, like, you know, meeting a need in a community, helping to find a solution and that it's going to be beneficial to the, to the, the community. And even back to the car tab idea, I, it's a, it's a good idea, but is this something the community would want? Does a community think that would be a helpful way to, you know, relieve the burden of, of um, the car tab expense? So for me, it's, it's, I'm noticing it takes me a little bit longer because I definitely want to do the research. I want to make sure it's actually going to create change and it's what the community wants. But I have a long list. You know, I want to make sure I'm passing legislation around housing, stability, digital equity, you know, access um, to broadband, um, getting our community members back to work. It took because I'm a new senator, it took some time to hire, you know, my LA and my session aid and get my team together. And so there was some legislation that was proposed that I didn't necessarily have my team together to help me to track all the steps and track <laughs> legislation. So I might've missed some opportunities of some bills that folks were, you know, hoping I would lead for them, but I'll get my groove. And I have a collection of bills that I'm excited to, I'm hoping to drop this week. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll sign on to a bunch of other bills that I think are, are really cool and really impactful. Mm -hmm. I think out of everything amazing that you just talked about, one thing, one item issue that's especially um, resonates with me is around DV. Um, and, it's, and it's because I live in Washington state because I was a um, in a domestic violence situation. And if it weren't for me having family here, because essentially I had to start my whole career and everything over and um, meeting the people who I met, you know, I could be um, a newspaper headline. And so I feel very, um, I'm very committed to anything that helps to provide additional care and security for people and to simply um, educate the community about it because a lot of folks have um, in their mind a picture of who might be a domestic violence victim and you just don't know. Um, and it, it transcends gender, color, um, socioeconomic, um, position everything. So whatever I can do to be a, um, a support, I'm, I'm happy to do that, especially in that regard. Thank you. I think you just signed up to testify on my bill, but um, I'll follow up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy, happy to do that. So, um, wow, this was, this was so good. I, we, you will be back. 
because we will want to hear about what's happening. Um, I think one of the great things about Tacoma and Pierce County is the relationship we have with so many of our elected officials where we can reach out and um, just real people who will say, hey, here's what's going on, or hey, here's what we need uh, the community to rally around this issue. So that's, that's just a great thing. And I think that's the way it's supposed to be. Absolutely. And I love the city for those same reasons as well. So I want to say to you again, thank you so much for having been part of Straight Talk, an integral part of Straight Talk, helping to get this launched, all of the resources that you brought to bear with your staff and your thinking. Thank you. Thank you um, for the partnership and thank you for the support. And in closing, I also just want to thank everyone who joined in on the call. And this has been recorded and it's also streaming live on Facebook. And that's great. We can always go back and check it out again. And actually, Senator, I would like to ask you to just close us out. Thank you. Again, I feel tremendously honored to be in this position. We talked about unique inaugurations and I was sworn in from my home in a private ceremony with the only black female justice of our Washington State Supreme Court, um, also witnessed by my family and um, Mayor Woodard to his family. Um, and then Justice Gonzalez conducted a swearing in for all of us um, reelected and new members virtually. Um, I really encourage folks, I think today might be the deadline to apply for the president and CEO position with Tacoma Urban League. So please head to our website. Um, you can probably find online too kind of my, my um, I wouldn't say final words because I'll probably give another heartfelt, you know, before I go. Um, but at least if you want to read my blog post, because it, it includes a lot of really cool updates and, and what the new CEO will inherit and build on um, and, and simply, you know, make, make better as they're creating their own footsteps. But, um, you know, happy new year to our community. Thank you all for your love and your continued support. Straight Talk continues. Um, and in 2021, better than ever before. But Pam, I just want to thank you truly for being my Sara, my sister, my sister and my sister, um, <laughs> but just a, a really great friend. And I want to thank you as well, Rob, for um, managing technical assistance and also for your, your friendship and your care for this community. And um, Amanda isn't here that I can see, but Amanda Westbrook also for jumping in, you know, with your invitation to lead as a moderator for this conversation. But Pam, this has been an incredible journey and community. I just want to say thank you. I love you and continue to tune in to Straight Talk and, you know, follow all of my state Senate social media because today it's official. The Senate has some melanin. <laughs> but I love you all and thank you. Have a fabulous night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.